Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the Zero Carbon Futures uh, Pavilion, sponsored by Clean Air Task Force. My name is Carlos Leipner. Uh, I lead the nuclear program uh, for CATF. And it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to be here with all of you uh, at COP28, particularly at this event where we're going to uh, uh, talk about nuclear energy at scale. Uh, so it's an exciting uh, time for us here at COP as we start the second week. And it seems like after the first week, uh, this has been a nuclear cop, right? With all the uh, uh, events surrounding nuclear, uh, the uh, uh, culminating obviously with the signing of uh, over 22 countries now on the net zero for nuclear uh, initiative. So that's uh, terrific and we're encouraged by that, uh, uh, especially as we are all looking at tripling uh, the capacity uh, in the next decades. Uh, but with that comes a lot of challenges, and that's what we're going to be discussing today and uh, potential solutions uh, for that. So uh, with that, uh, what we have planned uh, for this morning, if I can click for the next, uh, here we go. I'm uh, so uh, delighted to have uh, a wonderful uh, group of folks here uh, to, uh, for this dialogue. Um, and uh, the way we're going to do this, I'll be spending some time uh, in the next few minutes to, uh, to talk about a particular report the CATF uh, is actually launching uh, officially today uh, that culminates the work that we have been doing for the last several years, which is uh, a pathway for uh, scaling up nuclear and that offers various uh, uh, solutions uh, for scaling up nuclear. Uh, many of those solutions are integrated into a separate report which was launched on Monday of this week, uh, uh, labeled uh, a global uh, playbook for nuclear uh, for embarking countries. And uh, that was done in collaboration of uh, CATF with the Energy Futures Initiative and the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Uh, and we're very proud of that. And uh, uh, so we, we encourage you to look for those two reports. So I'll be reviewing the first report. Ross uh, McEnbridger from NTI uh, will be reviewing uh, this playbook uh, report. And then uh, we're fortunate to have Steve Camillo from the Energy Futures Initiative to uh, lead and moderate a, a panel discussion uh, with a very distinguished guests here, uh, uh, being led by uh, Dr. Huff, uh, Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy for the DOE. Uh, we have Enri Palier, uh, Head of Planning and Economic Studies at the IEA. Uh, Michelle Barthelemy, uh, Chief of Staff and Nuclear Advisor at, uh, at the NEA, the Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, Stephen Yamoa, Executive Director of uh, the Nuclear Power Ghana and uh, Anna Birchall, the special envoy from Nuclear Electrica, uh, Romania. So uh, very uh, fortunate about that. Uh, as a, a reminder uh, for those uh, joining us here, uh, this is being uh, not only recorded, but uh, transmitted and offered in uh, live translation, uh, which uh, you can use uh, the uh, QR codes uh, here uh, present that you can then uh, be more uh, easier for you to follow. Um, and also, re another reminder, the mics are on, and then uh, our uh, uh, IT folks here will be uh, uh, turning them on, right, uh, as each one of you uh, progress. So that's uh, terrific. Okay, so let's dive into this uh, a little bit more uh, and to set the context. Um, okay, so energy is essential, right, uh, for all of us, and, uh, but the world faces a, a triple challenge today, which is uh, how to obtain uh, secure, affordable, and clean energy at scale. I think that's the, the key challenges. And, uh, and there are other considerations that up to a few years ago, uh, it, weren't, it wasn't uh, considered, such as land use, um, uh, critical materials and this inputs for all the, the, the clean energy transition, uh, systems and grids approach. Uh, many of these things uh, point to the fact that uh, in all forecasts, uh, on how to reach net zero by 2050, um, we need nuclear to achieve that, to get to that point. So uh, uh, nuclear certainly has a, a role to play. Uh, we have uh, stagnated in a way to grow in growth uh, in the last decades, much of that driven by, as you know, high costs, uh, uh, slow delivery. Uh, even a east versus west, we've seen a, a tremendous growth of nuclear in the east, but as you look in the west, we've been uh, you know, very intermittent in terms of projects which have caused issues with supply chains, project management, uh, and project experience. And, uh, but we've seen a revived uh, interest in the public and, uh, and even uh, success stories, right? Uh, so we have uh, here at, uh, at UAE, the Baraka projects uh, have been uh, successfully delivered, and we followed that uh, very closely. Uh, we have now uh, uh, 
through so many challenges in the U.S. now, the, uh, the, the Vogel units coming on board, which is exciting. Uh, uh, and then obviously the global focus on small modular reactors and advanced reactors. So that seems to be um, uh, uh, an opportunity for the sector to reflect and see what happens, what needs to be done. The first thing we want to say uh, here is uh, we need to move from a slow and expensive mega projects uh, to a more product based approach. And uh, I think that's what, it could be a cliche, but uh, it really is uh, 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 thinking more in terms of product base instead of projects. And what we have seen is that the current business model and delivery model for nuclear uh, is flawed, right? Uh, we, we know that uh, we are focusing on building large uh, bespoke infrastructure projects, uh, which are complex to build, uh, difficult to finance, uh, and even to construct. And uh, what we really need to, to move towards is, uh, you know, this analogy of building more uh, Boeings instead of cathedrals, right? So uh, we need to focus on, 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 on other things. And we can borrow a lot from uh, adjacent industries, right? So we've seen uh, uh, the shipping industry, uh, you know, moving to a commoditized uh, 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 fashion. We have seen uh, combined cycle gas turbines, uh, you know, uh, even aviation. Uh, uh, being uh, uh, perhaps a lessons learned that we can take on to the nuclear side. And, uh, and we've seen some of this already uh, in some projects, right? Modularization, uh, but we need to take that to, take that to the next step. And uh, we've seen uh, uh, you know, great examples of that over, over the years in other industries. Second solution here we'd like to, to focus on is developing uh, uh, a large order book. Uh, and, that, and, and demand aggregation. We've seen many project by project uh, contracts and uh, here we, we, we know we need to think differently. And this is not that different than what we ha may have examples in the past. Obviously in France, in South Korea, we've seen examples of that, how uh, nuclear has uh, uh, grown in a, in a short period of time uh, and been able to achieve uh, uh, synergies and cost advantages. Uh, and even here at UAE, in the more recent example, we've heard uh, this past week how from the first unit uh, at Baraka to the third uh, and into the fourth, that we've seen reductions in 35% in, in, in terms of cost or more, which are uh, quite, uh, quite encouraging. So uh, we know that we need to work on, 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 on some of these things. And for us then, demand aggregation uh, to develop large order books here would mean uh, several things. First, it could be firm commitments from a, a single nation or perhaps consortia from uh, uh, both public and private sectors, uh, utilities, uh, non-utility off-takers, uh, but also uh, thinking about policies that could uh, favor and support uh, these large aggregation uh, orders. And obviously part of that means that uh, we should see uh, a down selection of technologies. We know we have over, well, 70 designs in advanced reactors in development uh, today. And uh, clearly, uh, as we fast forward in 10, 15 years, we, we will not see all that number uh, being deployed at scale. We, we, we should see a natural uh, selection uh, on that. So uh, the next, uh, if I could do it here. There we go, Kyle. Up, oh, here we go. The next solution is uh, that we're proposing is uh, related to regulatory, uh, actually uh, integrated uh, plant delivery services. And what we've seen again is this uh, today a highly fragmented uh, approach to uh, uh, building these nuclear projects that leads to very large inefficiencies, and uh, uh, and as well as how to approach risk and accountability in these projects. So uh, we are recommending uh, the creation of independent nuclear development organizations. Uh, these could be, uh, uh, you know, while having a commercial uh, purpose, uh, it could also have a public uh, focus, uh, you know, and, and very much uh, agnostic in terms of technology. So uh, we believe this could be a, a, a solution. Uh, and how, the way this would work would be to integrate the various phases of, uh, of project execution all the way from, uh, the very front end of site selection and, and evaluation and assessments all the way through construction, uh, RFPs, and, uh, and, and delivery uh, of, uh, of a nuclear project. So we believe this could be a, a game changer in there. 
Uh, I had mentioned licensing, so licensing is another uh, aspect that we all know uh, needs to be thought uh, differently. And uh, uh, we know that this is uh, something that uh, vendors today face, right? Even though they may have a project license in a certain uh, country, when they take that design to another country, there's a, not a first of a kind, but a first of a country, again, uh, approach to licensing. So we know that uh, we would like to see this on a global scale, and what we are, uh, uh, there are several things here that we are proposing, but one of them is uh, the creation of a global licensing authority. I know that we have been uh, seeing a, a lot of uh, potential harmonization efforts uh, on licensing uh, across the board. Uh, we're encouraged, for instance, the uh, uh, approach between Canada and the United States uh, on SMRs, that we've seen positive steps uh, in terms of uh, how to rationalize uh, the licensing approach uh, in terms of that technology. But we think that we could borrow and go even more further, uh, borrowing perhaps from the uh, uh, examples of the Canadian say, the vendor design review process that looks at early design assessments, all the way to uh, the civil aviation industry where uh, they themselves uh, uh, set standards such that each country then can uh, can uh, uh, approve and license uh, these uh, these technologies. So the GLA uh, we are proposing here to be fully transparent, vetted by national strat uh, national uh, regulatory bodies, and and have a wide range. It's not a prescriptive, but perhaps have a, uh, the design acceptance certificate being uh, uh, being part of their own internal uh, licensing uh, process, or take it as okay, this is the license design, let's just implement it. So there's a wide range uh, here. Uh, and uh, so we see this as a potential uh, game changer to accelerate uh, nuclear as well. Five is a technical support for uh, embarking nations. And uh, for this one here, we're proposing this uh, international uh, technical support organization. Again, we see uh, many of these embarking countries obviously following the 19 milestones from the IAEA and implementing those, uh, those uh, processes, however, uh, there's a big gap in terms of resources, uh, uh, both in terms of human resources and financing, financing, uh, financial resources. So we see the ITSO as uh, an, uh, an organization to bridge the gap uh, in terms of conducting uh, and reviewing licensing review applications, uh, assisting with inspections, providing training, and uh, we think this, uh, again, is another way to bridge the gap uh, of uh, implementing nuclear in uh, embarking countries. And then finally, uh, financing challenges. Uh, this obviously is one that uh, uh, plagues uh, the nuclear sector quite a bit. It's very difficult to access um, traditional funding. And uh, of course, this, some of this is driven by lack of familiarity uh, of nuclear projects, uh, lack of understanding really of the risks associated with a, a nuclear project as well as gaps in financing, right? We know that, uh, for instance, uh, U.S. projects, uh, many of them uh, uh, can be supported by the Exim Bank, but that's not, uh, there are gaps associated with that. And uh, how do we fill in those gaps? So uh, to that end, we are uh, proposing a uh, international bank for nuclear infrastructure. Uh, again, this is not an idea from CATF, but CATF is, uh, is uh, supporting that. Uh, which it would be uh, another mechanism for uh, uh, potential stakeholders to access uh, and, uh, and augment the other financing um, uh, instruments. So uh, we think this would uh, provide abilities not only to uh, finance nuclear reactor projects, but also uh, uh, supply chain uh, development, particularly in embarking countries. And uh, this bank would set standards to promote bankable projects and, and perhaps uh, uh, be that bridge until these projects are, are, are let's say, uh, reduce risk enough that uh, more traditional uh, financing mechanisms uh, could be available. So in conclusion here, uh, we have these six uh, uh, solutions that we're uh, putting forward. Uh, many of these, uh, I guess, dovetails quite well in the, in the next presentation, which is, will be the playbook uh, report that, that, uh, uh, that Ross will, will, will mention. But we think that these are instrumental in order to, uh, to really uh, uh, scale up nuclear. Uh, and uh, and it's, a, uh, it's a mutually reinforcing uh, set of ideas that uh, we think we need to address all of those uh, in order to be successful, uh, both the regulatory system, the project execution, as well as the, uh, the bankability uh, aspect of it. So some key, key points here to remember. This is, uh, again, a, a more radical departure. You know, we're challenging 
here, the nuclear sector to think differently. Um, and uh, it's necessary for us, we believe, to, uh, for nuclear to reach a meaningful uh, scale up. And uh, here's a challenge for all of us to have the courage to, uh, to address that. So with that, uh, I know it rushed a little bit, but I uh, wanted to pass on to my colleague Ross and uh, to talk about the nuclear playbook. Great. Well, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am uh, really excited uh, to be here today to uh, have this opportunity to introduce uh, this report that uh, we have uh, uh, put out here at COP28, um, which uh, we call the Nuclear Playbook. Um, it is a collaboration uh, between the uh, Clean Air Task Force, uh, EFI Foundation, and the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, and what, is, uh, what it essentially is, is a series of uh, options uh, for um, scaling up uh, nuclear power globally uh, in a responsible, sustainable, and effective way. Uh, and so you will see some similarities between the playbook and um, the report that, that Carlos uh, just outlined, um, but that is uh, not a mistake. Uh, we really see the playbook as a complementary report, uh, not just to uh, uh, the North Star report that uh, Carlos outlined, but other initiatives that we're seeing here at COP, um, including uh, Net Zero Nuclear um, and, and others. Um, and it really is meant to be symbiotic uh, and working hand in hand with these other uh, initiatives. But so then, um, why now? Why the playbook? Uh, and, and what's different? So. First, of course, is the urgency of the moment. Uh, and I, I don't think I need to talk about this too much as we are here at COP. Uh, we all understand um, the, the urgent uh, uh, climate crisis that we are in, um, the urgency of needing to uh, reduce emissions, and the fact that nuclear energy uh, can play a really important part in achieving those goals. Um, but we also know that the, the current model doesn't scale. Um, we saw that really exciting announcement the other day of um, 22 plus countries now aiming to triple uh, nuclear uh, capacity by 2050. Um, and in order to do that, depending on exactly how you calculate, but uh, from my calculations, it means um, at least uh, an additional 40 gigawatts of capacity per year between now and 2050. Um, so the playbook really talks about uh, how we can uh, uh, scale in ways that, that we're just not uh, doing right now. Um, and then um, we, we um, wanted to present a comprehensive uh, approach. And so we really um, took a look at um, uh, all the dimensions uh, that we thought were important to that responsible, sustainable, uh, and effective uh, uh, nuclear energy program uh, and put them here uh, all under uh, one uh, report. Um, and so uh, those uh, six dimensions, uh, as you can see, project execution, uh, regulatory system, project bankability, and finance, um, these first three uh, really talk to the um, uh, uh, cost ecosystem um, and, and really, I think, uh, um, are very um, much hand in hand in lockstep with um, the, the North Star report that Carlos outlined. Um, but then we also have um, some fundamental uh, dimensions uh, that, that we go over in the playbook uh, on um, nuclear nonproliferation and security. Uh, spent nuclear fuel uh, and uh, workforce development. Um, I should say that um, we look at these dimensions with a particular eye on um, uh, 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 embarking countries and how these might apply for countries that don't have uh, uh, nuclear energy currently, but there's also a lot of applicability for um, established countries as well. Um, we see uh, uh, we, we, we see what we lay out in the playbook not um, as uh, a prescriptive, but again as uh, a series of options. Um, but uh, you know, recognizing what, what we try and do here is bring a little bit of um, uh, order and guidance to what is otherwise a very uh, difficult and complex ecosystem to navigate. 
Uh, so our first pillar is project execution. I'm going to go a little bit quick through some of these just because it's very similar to um, what you saw um, uh, uh, from uh, Carlos. Um, so we know the challenges with the current status quo. Um, but um, in terms of then what does the playbook uh, really uh, recommend or, or lay out? And so um, there's a couple of key actions. One, um, moving again from that um, uh, 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 project-based approach uh, to a product-based approach. And so this is the um, standardization, replicability, um, uh, 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 mass production. Um, and then um, just to kind of foot stomp a little bit of what Carlos said on um, securing large order books um, and uh, the uh, importance of um, not just doing a lot of first of a kind builds, but really being able to down select from the, I mean, we have uh, uh, 80 plus designs that are in various stages of development, which is fantastic, but the hard job of being able to down select, uh, coalesce around one or, or maybe um, a small number um, of designs uh, and being able to do that quite quickly, again, to meet the enormous uh, and urgent challenge uh, we have uh, in front of us. Um, so the proposed initiatives we have, um, this uh, integrated uh, development uh, organization, um, really bringing together uh, different parts of the value chain to unify risk. Um, and then we also have some specific uh, uh, ideas and initiatives um, for how to create that demand aggregation uh, and an order book. Um, on uh, regulatory systems, this, uh, this is our second pillar and, uh, of course, uh, critical. Um, and, and we raise uh, this recognizing sorry, recognizing um, that uh, embarking countries are going to need some uh, technical assistance to build uh, capacity and expertise. Um, and so um, we, we uh, uh, float this idea also of an international technical support organization um, as, as a way for the uh, established countries to be able to deliver for embarking countries so that we are um, moving as quickly as possible toward our shared goals. Um, and then also the um, Global Design Acceptance Certificate, um, which borrows from um, some best practices in the aviation industry uh, and others. Uh, our third pillar is project bankability and finance, and three quick points that I'll run through here. Um, first is about um, uh, minimizing capital costs, and this goes to kind of what um, I, I've been talking about over the, the last couple slides uh, of building order books, replicability, uh, unified project management. Um, second point here is about uh, minimizing the cost of capital. Um, and so really how can we uh, de-risk projects, particularly in embarking countries, uh, making, more, uh, making financing more attractive uh, for these projects? Um, and one of the ideas we also talk about a little bit in our playbook um, is this idea for uh, an international bank for nuclear infrastructure, uh, but there are some other uh, ideas uh, in there as well. Um, and then um, uh, uh, supporting an adequate revenue model. And, and, and look, we understand that there has to be certainty um, in terms of uh, cost recovery to get quality investment. And um, we, we have some um, proposals in the playbook for how we can go about uh, achieving this. Um, and so, so those are the cost ecosystem uh, uh, dimensions, pillars. Um, and uh, now for some of the fundamentals, um, our uh, fourth uh, dimension here is on uh, nuclear nonproliferation and security. And I think sometimes nonproliferation can be seen as kind of a burden that has to be overcome uh, in order to um, uh, have a successful nuclear program. But the case we make is that uh, quite the opposite, that nonproliferation can be a project enabler. And uh, a great example of where we've seen this in practice is right here in the UAE um, with their uh, Baraka project, where very early on um, in the uh, project planning process, they made some really robust commitments uh, to nonproliferation. Uh, they committed to um, 
uh, 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 not um, enriching or reprocessing. Um, and um, far from being a burden to their program, they've actually uh, talked about this, that it actually helped um, uh, it, it, it took the shackles off their program. It um, really eliminated any concern there may have been in the international uh, community um, and allowed them to move full steam ahead um, on their core nuclear energy goals. Um, and so, um, you know, here in this pillar, we talk about established international practices, clearing that path for the core goals of, of energy development. Um, we do lean into the once through fuel cycle based on light water reactor um, and, and low enriched uranium fuels. And um, this um, has, I think, served much of the international community very well in terms of energy goals, but is also, um, uh, it, it, it steers away from uh, using uh, weapons usable material, uh, separated plutonium in particular, um, as part uh, of the fuel cycle, and that's re uh, really great for nonproliferation. Um, we talk about uh, relying on um, the international market uh, for uh, fuel, and that's been a reliable uh, way for many countries uh, to uh, get their fuel without having to uh, get into um, what could be proliferation-sensitive technologies. Um, on the um, security side, we, we talk about um, really planning for security from the early stages, and this being uh, positive not just for security, but also um, for project costs in the long run. Um, and then on safeguards, uh, we have a robust international system uh, for safeguards, and so we talk about the importance of meeting or, or even um, uh, exceeding those standards. Uh, our uh, fifth pillar um, is uh, spent uh, nuclear fuel. Um, and here our uh, kind of bottom line is wanting to point out that uh, all reactors uh, and fuel cycles um, require a uh, permanent repository and so it's important to uh, have some sort of planning process uh, towards that. Um, the uh, uh, principal options for managing spent fuel being uh, direct disposal and uh, reprocessing and recycling and so we try and demystify a little bit um, We've seen some uh, uh, confusion about um, what reprocessing and recycling might bring for um, uh, uh, spent nuclear fuel management. And we just want to be clear that it's not um, a panacea or a silver bullet and that, in fact, uh, can actually um, uh, complicate uh, and, uh, the, the process. And so um, we do lean into direct disposal and how it simplifies spent fuel management. Um, and. Um, uh, this is also um, a, a pro for nonproliferation. Um, we also talk about the importance of uh, interim storage, um, recognizing that it takes time to really develop that permanent repository, um, and that uh, we have a lot of great um, international experience to point to for um, success on interim storage. Um, and then, you know, we just want to make the point that spent nuclear fuel, um, the management, this, this. Um, can seem like a very daunting task. We want to make the point that it can be managed safely, securely, economically. And uh, look, I'm the first to admit that this is not um, an area where established countries have always done a great job. Um, but um, the embarking countries don't need to repeat the same mistakes. Um, and so we think that there's a lot of lessons learned um, that uh, uh, we can um, kind of highlight for embarking countries to keep in mind. Uh, our uh, final pillar then is workforce development. Um, and so, um, you know, again, looking at the enormity of the task in front of us, we know that um, a, uh, a solid workforce is something that's going to be a, a really important resource for us to, to develop, um, while at the same time um, recognizing that there is limited global expertise um, uh, uh, at this point in time. So, um, there's uh, a few approaches that we highlight in um, uh, the playbook. Um, and so first is really taking an assessment of uh, the domestic workforce, um, see what's available and, and um, uh, uh, what uh, you can do there. But then also taking a look at regional partnerships. How can we, we be working with our friends and with our neighbors um, to really um, bring force multipliers uh, into uh, workforce development? 
Um, and then finally, um, uh, talent exchanges. And so this could be, for example, bringing folks um, from embarking countries, embedding them in uh, existing uh, projects in established countries to really build up uh, that knowledge base uh, and expertise. And so uh, the proposed initiative here is, again, that uh, international technical support organization. So just to conclude, um, you know, uh, I feel that progress uh, can, in fact, probably progress must uh, begin now. Um, and we know that there are going to be some new international institutions and initiatives that we feel uh, are needed. Um, but uh, as we work on those, uh, in order to meet <laughs> these goals and, and the urgent challenge of the moment, we, we, really, need to be get go uh, we really need to get going now. Um, Again, we recognize one size does not fit all. Um, every country is going to have their own approach, but what the playbook, I, I think, um, is able to do is bring some uh, organization and guidance to what is otherwise a complex and hard to navigate ecosystem. Um, while the playbook is largely um, uh, um, aimed at um, embarking countries, there is a lot of applicability to established countries as well. Um, and then finally, while we do not um, explicitly uh, uh, address public support uh, in the uh, playbook, um, we recognize how important it is. And I think some of the challenges we see with public support these days is often al around, along the lines of being able to, um, uh, the challenges with being able to deliver projects on cost uh, and uh, on time. Um, and so we think that some of the principles that we've laid out here in the playbook will really help with uh, the public support angle as well. So I will end things there. Um, I am uh, very excited for the panel that we have uh, coming up. And I will turn things over to our moderator, Steve Camello. Steve? Thank you. Thank you, Ross, and thank you, Carlos, for those wonderful uh, presentations outlining frameworks, essentially, for how do we scale nuclear uh, into the future. And to give a sense of scale, you know, and, and Ross basically uh, put this out there, that we need to build on the order of 40 gigawatts a year for 25 years, essentially, or 20, 20 to 25 years. And to put that into perspective, that's at least 40 gigawatt scale facilities per year for decades. And if you think about SMRs and, not, and, and believing that not all technologies uh, are going to be at the gigawatt scale, it could be thousands of new uh, reactors. That, as we say in the US, is a long putt. But you can still score a birdie if you are a golf fan. And I'm really excited to have this conversation because if nuclear, as I believe, is the unexpected winner at COP28, um, and that has been uh, put forward by a number of ambitious pledges, now we move to the need for um, implementation. And, and you know, I'll borrow from Dr. Huff, we need to deploy, deploy, deploy. And if we are to deploy, 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 um, one central element in that, we believe, is the order book. The order book is the, the unit for which we need to rally around to uh, create the uh, supply to meet the demand that's there. Also, through an order book, one would, could believe that these learning effects will start to take over, and that's where cost certainty will start to uh, play a role. That's where skill building will start to become institutionalized and, um, and uh, wi uh, widely uh, available. But I want to open the conversation to the panel. I actually don't have to answer anything. I have a very esteemed panel that can weigh in on this issue, and we'll do so for the next 55 minutes. But I do want to start with this idea of the order book. Um, to what extent do you believe it is the central unit for which we should focus? And what are the key elements of an order book that we should really think about to reach the scale on an annual basis that we need to achieve? So I'm going to pose that question to each of you, but I'm going to ask Dr. Huff to first weigh in on that idea. 
Yeah, thanks for this, and, and thanks for those presentations, and thanks for the reports. I think they, they look really good. You know, Carlos, ultimately, in North Star, the first three items are really nicely aligned with not only the commercial liftoff reports, but also the National Academy study that's laying the foundations for deployment of advanced nuclear. So I think you guys are really right on the money. You know, in, in your case, Ross, I think it's sort of numbers one, three, and six, right? But very similar alignment. In terms of the order book, you know, Critically, I think not only does it help with learning curves, but when we think about, you know, in the U.S., that tripling will look sort of like almost 10 gigawatts a year for the next 25 years. Uh, it's probably a little closer to nine would get us to what we need because we need to get to about 300 gigawatts. We have about 94 gigawatts. You, you get the picture. The critical part is not just the learning, but the supply chain. If you do your homework the night before, in a 2050 goal, forgive me if you were at the World Nuclear Exhibition, I'm gonna tell the same story here, but I used to be a professor, right? And there are students who will leave it till the last minute, and we cannot leave 200 gigawatts to 2049, because what's required? It means you have to build 200 pressure vessels or possibly 600 pressure vessels in 2047. And you have to build that, you know, all the components 200 times in factories that, you know, don't need to be that big. So for every, you know, for all of those rates, you're looking at capacities for the supply chain that also have to grow if we leave it some years from now. So we need, you know, five to ten orders in the next year or two um, of a single design in order for us to get to a place where we're developing the supply chains, the factories, the component development, the, like, the specific, you know, uh, pieces and parts, and in fact, even humans required, because we're not suddenly going to create that n number of nuclear engineers in 2049 either, or 2045, or when you know when it's going to be necessary. So we do have to not leave this homework to last minute, not just because 2050 is coming, but also because it will be significantly more costly to build out a supply chain that supports doing it at the last minute. Thank you, Henri. I'm going to pass it off to you. You've done a lot of work on. Um, overall um, capacity that will be required and how that essentially would be distributed around the world. Um, so keeping that in mind and some of the work that you've been doing, and, and by the way, thank you also to the IAEA for allowing us to, uh, your pavilion, the Atoms for uh, Climate, which was the venue for which we um, released our uh, playbook uh, report on, on December 4th. But back to the, the, the fact of the matter uh, with respect to the order book, what's your, what's your view and, and how do you think about an order book on a global scale? So th th thank you for the questions and thank you for inviting the IAEA in this uh, panel discussion. Um, I, I, I heard earlier on this uh, 40 gigawatt a year for uh, to reach uh, to triple uh, capacity. Um, we we have some different numbers that are a little uh, lower than that, fortunately. Um, our our own projections because we're the agency. Uh, publishes every year its uh, uh, nuclear capacity projections to 2050. And what we have seen in the last uh, three years is uh, 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 an increase in, uh, in our high case uh, projections for 2050. Um, the, 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 the latest uh, uh, projection uh, would take us to, 100, to 890 gigawatts of nuclear, which would be a uh, a factor of 2.3 compared to, to, to uh, today, so not quite three. Um, but uh, um, to get to 890 or even to triple, uh, we have to rely on uh, uh, not only new build, but also a, a lifetime, uh, long-term operation of the existing fleet. And I think probably that's where the difference in numbers come from because uh, uh, we, we, we consider maybe optimistic uh, but uh, uh, necessary uh, assumptions regarding uh, uh, long-term operation of the existing fleet, which uh, somehow lessens the pressure on, 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 on the new build and allows that uh, ramp up uh, in, in uh, capacity in the industry and in the supply chain in, in, in uh, the human resources also to, to, to build up. Um, so um, in any case, what to, to reach uh, that high case, we will need to really multiply by at least three the current level of, uh, of uh, 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 projects. That means uh, um, multiply at least by three the investment, 
um, uh, and uh, we need we need these order books. I, I, th I think the, the point about uh, uh, large order books, this is really the, the signal that industry, the supply chain needs to, to invest, to recruit uh, uh, the, the skilled workers that, that, are, that are needed. In terms of regional uh, uh, projections, we have seen for a number of years, of course, Asia as uh, 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 the area of the world where there's uh, the most uh, uh, new build. But in the last two years, in the context of uh, uh, enhanced uh, um, consideration for, for, for climate change mitigation and, 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 and reaching net zero goals, plus security of supply concerns, we have seen also uh, uh, a, a somehow a, a reverse uh, a reversal uh, in uh, 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 developed countries that have nuclear with the, uh, I say, more ambitious uh, expansion uh, programs that are being announced, uh, and uh, that's also a, a good signal. So, um, Asia uh, will uh, probably be uh, uh, leading in terms of new build, but also, uh, I would say, uh, Europe and the US uh, also. Um, in terms of developing countries, we are seeing uh, also a, 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 a rise in interest in, in nuclear power for a, a number of regions. Um, uh, I would say not, not just uh, the climate change, climate change is probably not the, the main uh, driver there, but it's uh, having a clean, firm power uh, for industrialization. Um, in terms of uh, technologies, uh, what we publish are, are just gigawatt numbers, sure. but we have the we have the data un uh, underneath. We we, we see uh, large reactors uh, providing the bulk of that expansion, but uh, uh, also small modular reactors, advanced reactors coming in uh, in uh, quite large numbers, but they still it represents a, a smaller uh, capacity, and uh, I think. Uh, um, from all the events that uh, I've attended this week uh, on the decarbonizing uh, uh, hard to abate sectors, industry, I think there is a realization that uh, we need nuclear, not just for electricity, but also for these uh, 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 decarbonization challenges. And that's probably going to be a, a demand uh, for, for, uh, for, for small modular reactors, advanced reactors that can deliver heat, hydrogen, and so on. Henri, thank you for that. And I do want to return later in the panel to something that you said ab um, about workforce development that maybe I'm over-indexing on by uh, calling out, which is perhaps there is a way to start expanding the necessary workforce through um, extending the life of existing um, reactors that with that, then you would have essentially more of a workforce ready to handle new kinds of, of uh, technologies. That's true. I mean, we've, we've seen this in, in Canada. I mean, that's the example that comes mm -hmm. to, to mind. The big refurbishment programs uh, are uh, uh, you know, driving uh, uh, recruitments and, and, uh, and human resource development in, in Canada and, and it puts them in a good position to, to, to start new build projects as well. Thank you. Anna, um, Romania is clearly uh, has high ambitions. Uh, for new nuclear, uh, you're looking to build order books both at the gigawatt scale and SMRs. Uh, Romania is a, a signatory to the Net Zero Nuclear um, Pledge, and um, your company is also, uh, from the industry perspective, also a signatory. How are you thinking about um, order book formation for your country, or even regionally? Well, firstly, thank you so much for inviting us to be present here. It was always an honor and a pleasure to be on uh, a panel with such uh, great uh, uh, colleagues. And I have to commend and congratulate each and all of you for the great work you've been doing, and especially to you and your team, because you are saying that the nuclear is the unexpected winner. Guess what? I was expecting to be the winner because since last year, when uh, the nuclear was uh, present at the COP, uh, on a modest way, but now we can see that this COP, uh, that uh, nuclear regain its role, uh, that uh, it should be strengthened and promoted uh, and continuously because, you know, again, it is science, not politics, that uh, the energy from the nuclear is not just one of the most stable, affordable, 
but it's a reliable and resilient source of energy, and you are not going to achieve any decarbonization goals without the nuclear. And we are very, very pleased in Romania and in Nuclear Electrica that finally this message that we've been promoting on and on is now finally heard. So um, before answering to your question, if I may, I would like to commence and congratulate you for the reports and for the playbook. I think it's not just timely, uh, but it's incredibly important, not just for the industry, and especially for the industry, but I think for the public at large as well, to see again the benefits, but lessons and recommendations that needs to be learned and needs to be promoted. And you can count on us to continue to promote those because there are really, really good lessons there that in Romania, for example, having uh, North American technology, and we are very proud that in the region, in Central Eastern Europe, since 1968, so older than I am, We've been going with the North American technology, with the Kandu uh, technology. Uh, so being the only one in the region, that means that we continue to have that skill force of workforce and experience and expertise that actually now we are very ready to help in the region and to deploy, to deploy and deploy, uh, not just the large uh, um, scale builds, but especially the SMRs as well. So. Um, a few lessons, if I may say, yeah, complementing what uh, Dr. Uh, Huff was saying and, uh, and our colleague, uh, probably um, a strategic planning is very important. I know sometimes when you, we use the word strategic, you just say, oh, it's, it's another word. No, if you are planning, uh, strategically speaking, when it comes to the supply chain, to your workforce, to your um, um, expertise, to have that governmental support as well. And in Romania, we are very happy we just passed the legislation at the government and at the uh, parliament level where for the uh, nuclear um, projects in Romania being, uh, you know, building the new uh, other two other units, uh, large scale plus the refurbishment, and I will come back to that as well. And uh, the SMRs is a, is a strong public uh, support and a political support because you were talking about earlier about the public support and maybe later I will give you the success story example of Romania where w how are we managing to have a continuous uh, support, public support of, of more than 80%. So uh, strategically planning on it when it comes to uh, the supply chain, to the workforce, to the education. In Romania, we have a very, very good long-standing education at the university, including having a master on the nuclear. Mm. Uh, so all those elements is practically adding two plus two, making five, uh, that will allow you to continue to promote uh, the source of energy from the nuclear, which is a very, very good one. So uh, yes, in uh, Romania, we are very uh, honored and happy that through uh, Nuclear Electrica, uh, at the present moment, we are providing 20% uh, of the Romanian energy just from the two reactors. We are in, adva you know, in, in our strat strategy to, to build two other units plus the SMRs, and we are very happy that with the help of the US, uh, we will be uh, deploying um, uh, in Europe um, and in the region those SMRs that will be complementary to the large-scale reactors that will secure that energy because energy, at least in our part of the world, as you all know, is not just a matter of commercial, but it's a matter of uh, security as well. And Romania National has security. all the ingredients to not just be uh, uh, energetic independent, but actually to be a provider of energy security in the region. And as we speak, we are helping the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine, including from nuclear electrica. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Yamoa. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, Ghana is also a signatory to the Net Zero Nuclear Pledge, um, joining uh, other 23 countries. Um, Ghana is also having a rich history in nuclear research, uh, is now at the cusp of um, building out its first commercial fleet. Um, take us through how you're thinking about that kind of order book. Um, is order book the right term to use? And to what extent are you expanding or working regionally with other partners to perhaps expand an order book, um, try to uh, have lessons learned to share resources to essentially scale up on a regional basis? Um, 
Thank you very much. And I uh, also want to add my voice to the previous panelists for the invitation extended to me to be part of this uh, discussion. I would say that, you know, especially from a developing country, any approach, strategy that will lead to a reduction of capital cost for the project, that will lead to, you know, reducing cost overruns, uh, schedule overruns, is a welcome approach. And obviously, the concept of the other book could be one way that can lead to such reduction. Um, having said that, um, you know, as a single country, especially from a developing country, let me talk in the context of you know, my region, you know, you are limited in terms of capacity within a specific frame of time that you can order, you can construct. And therefore, uh, a regional approach could be, you know, one option that can lead to, you know, large fleet of uh, uh, orders f over a specified period of time. In that context, you know, you, you, you'll be learning from construction experiences, operating experiences, maintenance because you are more or less you know, operating, constructing the same technology. However, there could be some you know, challenges that needs to be addressed regionally. Uh, and again, I will, I will limit myself in the context of the region I'm coming from. You know, one is political uh, willingness to get you know, multi-country approach where there is that political willingness and commitment to embark on such a project. Also, political willingness to get the general support of the people within each country, which is very important. And also the stability of the regime, you know. Uh, most often we face a situation where a party starts a project Another government comes and there is a break right. of that project. And for nuclear, it's going to be very costly if it is to happen in, in that context. Another, option, another challenge I see which needs to be addressed is the issue of regional planning. You know, if you are talking about multi-country approach, it means that there has to be a time frame within which these countries agree to have such a project because there should be you know the longer the project goes on the higher the cost and therefore you know the multi-country approach should have a limit within which all of these uh, so a regional approach is is, is one thing that um, um, in terms of the time frame to be able to ensure that such a concept can work then comes to uh, the other issue of regulatory legal frameworks within the multi-country approach, meaning that you know the participating countries should have an agreement, a common understanding, a standard legal framework, mm -hmm. regulatory framework, of which such a concept can become a beneficial. Otherwise, if there are differences in terms of legal approach, regulatory approach, that might also not work well with such a concept. And then the issue of technology. Again, it means the multi-country approach should agree on the same technology for multiple units. And then comes with it is the issue of, and that was talked about uh, uh, the presentation. Now we have so many technologies available. The lesser the technologies, the better it is to make a decision and a choice. However, with large fleet of technologies, then that becomes an issue to deal with. And then also with different technologies from different uh, vendors, each making their own approaches to these countries. So the country to, 
you know, the, the, the embarking country and the vendor country relationship also comes into play as to how you can navigate through such an approach to ensure that you have a group of countries that have decided to go on with a specific design. So these are, obviously, as I said, the, the order book approach is, is very good, um, very thoughtful. However, these are some challenges, at least I see in my region where I come from, that we need to navigate through to be able to realize the, the, the benefits of, of such a concept. Thank you. And you're teeing up the next question I want to get to. You still have to answer the original one. But th where I'm going is, you know, we have this tension, which is we need to scale quickly. But with what? Right? How do you down select pretty rapidly so that you can actually get order books of significant size of a given design? Um, you can think about that for now, but for you, uh, in the, uh, right now, um, not only has uh, this been the COP where net zero nuclear pledge has been uh, promulgated, but the NEA has uh, launched its accelerating SMRs for net zero. And so in the context of that project, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, but in the, pro in the context of that project, how do you think about the concept of the order book and what, what's needed to get it to, to, to fly? Well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, it's always very good to be uh, uh, with the uh, CATF and uh, uh, like the other panelists, uh, start by uh, commending the, the, the work you've done uh, with, uh, with uh, IFI and uh, uh, ETI uh, launching the playbook at, at COP. I think it's uh, one of the important uh, output of, of this COP, the, the launch of the, of the playbook, and, and particularly because you know, we, we've seen from leaders level uh, this high level pledge to triple nuclear capacity by 2050, uh, and, uh, and now it's time for action. Uh, but it also means uh, we need to, it's time to have uh, some big thinking uh, regarding nuclear energy and regarding uh, how we'll be able to address uh, our uh, you know, number of challenges uh, we have ahead, and, and clearly, uh, I think you've uh, you've been doing an excellent job at uh, at you know pinpointing what some of these kind of, uh, key challenges are. Now, what, when it comes to the order book, um, I, I think you know, as, you know, looking at the future is always good to to look back yeah. uh, and to look at how we've done it uh, in in the past, uh, and uh, and and some of the key lessons learned we we have and, and we've drawn uh, from from our work at the NEA. Uh, is that the reason why uh, projects have been successful uh, in the past uh, is that co countries, organizations uh, were able to commit to a program. Uh, and, and it's a little bit different from, from the notion of, of the order book, but the reason why uh, the French nuclear pro program was so successful in the 70s was because there was a high degree of visibility for the entire supply chain and the entire ecosystem to build a program, not just a project, but really a program uh, of, uh, of uh, multiple reactors. That's also the reason why the Koreans have been very successful. That's also the reason why Canada, Sweden, I mean, there is, there is a long list of countries that you know, shows the way for, for being successful uh, in, in building uh, nuclear power plants at scale and a uh, number of cases on time and on cost. Now, um, again, this backdrop, when I look maybe more specifically at OECD countries, uh, it's also important to recognize that since the last time we've built nuclear power plant at scale uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, the energy sectors have undergone very profound transformations. Uh, in many cases, we have divested uh, from our nuclear industry. Uh, in a number of cases, we have privatized. In many cases, we have liberalized electricity markets. So now we have to look at how to build another book in a very, very different um, ecosystem. Uh, and what I mean is that we need to, in particular, look how we can rebuild public-private partnerships uh, in, the, in, in this new uh, environment. And, and this is one of the things, uh, uh, going back to, to one of your questions, uh, we'll be trying to do at the NEA, specifically on SMR with this a new initiative uh, we've, we've launched uh, here at COP on accelerating SMR to net zero, where essentially you know, we, we, we were struck by the fact that if we are successful to deploy SMR at scale, 
uh, there is time for very serious conversation between public and private uh, uh, industries and, and stakeholders that want, that want to, to build SMR within this decade and then scale up in the decades ahead. And there is a number of enabling conditions uh, that we're going to need to unlock uh, to, move, uh, to move at scale. But maybe in addition to public-private partnership, uh, the other point for, for addressing the, uh, the, 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 the old book, uh, uh, which uh, I drew in particular uh, at, at this COP, and, and, and from the you know, number of discussion and excellent panels we've been having here, uh, is on the fact that um, the nuclear industry is also facing very profound transformation in terms of uh, on the demand side. Uh, because now we're looking at nuclear energy not only for on grid power, but for a number of hard to abet sectors, industrial sectors, uh, that uh, have realized that they're gonna need to decarbonize for real, not just buying carbon credits, they're gonna need to actually decarbonize. And when they look at how they can do that, uh, in many cases, they find that nuclear is one of the only options they have. Uh, and, uh, and I think, in particular, looking at heavy industry, uh, looking uh, at data centers. There have been a number of announcements from Microsoft and Google regarding nuclear here at, at COP. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the fact that we're, gonna, you know, we're bringing this new customer uh, that you know, will want to be educated customers and potentially have scale, scale in the game because they are going to play a role uh, in helping transform the nuclear sector to move at scale. And many of these industries, particular heavy industries, uh, chemical, oil and gas, they, they manage very large infrastructure complex projects and, and I think they're going to play a role uh, in uh, particular with SMR uh, to make sure we can accelerate and build this order book that we need to work in zero. Thank you for that. And um, so we've, we've generally agreed that an order book is a useful construct. Um, we have also learned that there is enhanced demand um, we know that there is high ambition. Um, I guess the next question, which I had uh, posed about five minutes ago, which is how do we decide? Um, who is the we in that question, and what specifically are we deciding upon? And again, this is in the context of, look, I used to be an academic myself. Uh, I was a professor, and you would let you know a thousand flowers bloom. Um, in this case, we can't. We have to um, harvest only the top. Um, how do you do that? How do you think about essentially scaling down the choice set so you can scale up the deployment? And I'm going to start with Anna. Actually, how do you think about that? Well. Before answering your question, uh, I will uh, complement what was said before about the financing. Let's not forget about the finance. You address it in your reports and uh, in your playbook. And I think we need, firstly, and here again, uh, Dr. Hav, her team, and U.S. has been leading in trying to, uh, I, and I'm saying in a constructive way, educating the financial institutions that they need to start investing in the nuclear projects because while at the beginning uh, those projects might look costly in the end of the day when you do math and again it's science is not politics you will uh, see that practically the energy provided uh, from nuclear it's one of the cheapest if not the cheapest so therefore while at the upfront you might have a big expand uh, you know, in terms of the financing or um, in the end of the day, it's actually, it's a wise investment. And I would like to actually start s shifting the narrative, if I may, from seeing the, the money spent on nuclear, not as a expenditure, but actually as an investment, as an investment in the present and especially in the future in a clean uh, environment and achieving all those uh, climate uh, goals that we are all agreeing and we are promoting. So, um, how do you choose? Um, well, I'm not going to pretend I can, uh, I know the answer to this, but I can share with you the experience of Romania. So, as I mentioned earlier, since the very, very beginning, we went to uh, uh, with the North American technology, that was our choice, wise choice, in terms of a strategic partner. 
uh, and that's why, you know, uh, even uh, these days, uh, as we are all pledging to create a green ecosystem, I will not, this is not, I learned it yesterday in one of the debates, and I loved it, uh, you know, to choose and create this uh, green ecosystem with your partners, strategic partners of choice and of trust. And of course, in the case of Romania, we, uh, we are going with the United States and with friends from Canada, France, and uh, um, you know, those are the Koreans, those are our uh, uh, strategic partners that we are embarking on those projects. So uh, when we decided how to go about the nuclear, we went with the two large bills. Now we are refurbishing uh, one unit uh, and that means we will be adding 30 more years of, uh, of uh, life to already 30 years. So in the end of the day, with that expense, you got 60 years. So this is a great example. And then we are building the other two uh, large units with the same uh, can do North American technology. But we took a very courageous but very strategic decision to be at the forefront of deploying the SMRs. And that's uh, just based on our great experience as an operator uh, at the highest level for now 27 years. Uh, and having that wealth when it comes to the expertise and experience, because uh, during this period we created the workforce. I mentioned the university. We are, as we speak, we launch actually with the help of uh, United States. We uh, at our university we have a simulator for the for the SMR. That means that we already started the training program for the workforce because that's your wealth as well. Uh, so it's it's that. Uh, wise choice when it comes to the planning, strategic planning, but executing it as well. It's not talks, it's actually action. And one word that I've been hearing these days here, uh, okay, it's good to talk, but let's more, uh, you know, more action. And that action is, uh, Dr. Huff always says, deploy, deploy, deploy. And those are not uh, just words. Those will be serious actions if we are all uh, uh, going together on this strategy, including at the regional level. And that's why, again, you can accuse me, I can speak with subjectivity because obviously coming from Romania and you know, nuclear electrica, it's up there. In fact, actually, uh, it's again, it's statistics. We are number one in the world uh, in terms of the safety operation. And that's a wealth that we could share. And another one that we have a great experience, again, that we can share not just in our region, but especially in our region, but worldwide, when it comes to the regulator. We have a very experienced and <coughs> thorough regulator. That's the Chenekan. Um, so I don't know if I answer your question, but I guess, you know, uh, when we've done our analysis, we looked at the options and we choose wisely and strategically. And you know what? Even though sometimes it was quite difficult because being the only one in the region with the North American technology when all the others were going with the, with the Russian technology, guess what? We've been proven to be right. In 2019, and I was personally involved in that when I was Minister of Justice, we took the strategic decision to go with the North American technology for the units three and four, so for the new, uh, for two other uh, bills, plus the SMRs. And that was at the time when it wasn't uh, you know, necessarily fashionable to stand up against the Russians. And we said, because look, take the energy away from the Russians because it's going to use it as a weapon. And that's why it is our strong, my strong belief, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I will always praise the efforts of the United States to really come in in our region, uh, along with our friends from, you know, other friends from France and so on, because um, you know, for us in the region, energy is not just a com in terms of the commercial terms. It's actually a matter of energy security. And that's very important, including when you choose right. uh, your mixer to answer to your question. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, very, very rich context uh, to the answer. Um, Dr. Huff, how do we, how do we choose yeah. few to build many? I think, you know, how do we choose is pretty easy if you're a single individual or a single end user. There are a variety of end users. There are a variety of end uses. I think, you know, the the how do you choose is much easier than the who chooses. And this gets back to the reports and the sort of aggregation of demand. 
there are classes of end uses that can be decided. You can decide the right reactor type, for example, based on those end uses pretty customer agnostically, as long as you know what size in terms of gigawatts, what size in terms of footprint. Is it providing electricity or heat? If it's providing heat, what temperature? If it's providing electricity, how flexible is it on the grid? You know, does it stay base load or does it, can it move around? You know, when you talk about, you know, a particular customer, then you get into these more nebulous questions about who's your right strategic partner? What's the gee whiz factor on the fuel that the community in that vicinity likes? You know, some very specific questions that start to get a little gnarlier. But if you focus on things like, you know, industrial decarbonization, they're going to have a lot of the same answers to those sort of set of technical questions. What size? You know, maybe they're in the tens or hundreds of megawatts. What do they want? Heat. How hot? Really hot, right? Um, those sorts of things, right? Yeah. And now you can cluster some of those demands, one hopes, by getting customers together. I think that's going to have to be the role of the US, because we have no command and control system over our customer base. It is certainly the case that the United States federal government is a customer. And the executive order recently from the president to accelerate net zero for our federal consumption of power does play a role in allowing us to be a customer and perhaps make choices about reactors, especially when we look at things like Department of Defense uh, sites, whether it's military bases or, you know, even just barracks that soldiers live in that, like, live, you know, require district heating. These are going to be very similar to university campuses and prisons and very large residential hospital campuses. They all have very similar energy needs, but DOD could go first and pick a reactor that fits that kind of set of needs. And then maybe it makes it easier for university campuses and hospitals and prisons and whatnot to make their choice. And I think we want to see the same thing in terms of federal computer systems, maybe providing a model for data centers. Or let the data center companies get all together and decide on their own as a big aggregated group. Um, but I think that's what we're going to have to do is to sort of first see those customers connect, yep. figure out who's going to be some of the first movers, and are they big enough to aggregate the demand and make a choice? Because the how and the who kind of get a little nebulous once you go from end use to end user. Yeah, very helpful. And so it sounds like to answer that question, start with the demand and see if you can create a, a buyer's club for certain uh, specif specifications or, speci or specified designs. Um, Dr. Yamo, how, how do you think about selection uh, or down selection uh, when it comes to uh, nuclear technology? Yes. Um, so, like you initially asked, who are the we? And yeah. I think it's uh, vendors, technology developers, um, you know, multinational and uh, banks, governments, regulatory bodies, all of us has to be involved if we are to make a headway uh, in, in, in this direction. And I agree with Dr. Hoff in terms of, you know, based on priorities, you know exactly what you want, and then you go for it. However, if we're talking about other books in the context of other books and uh, so different countries with different priorities and that becomes even more complex and I was wondering f you know the, the, there's a good reference in the in, in, in the in the playbook uh, referencing the aviation industry in terms of you know commercial uh, aircraft that you, you just probably two 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 vendors so it makes it easy if if you want to select in that context and of course I think the the gas turbine also just a few handful of that however you come to the nuclear industry and you have this multiplicity of of technologies of vendors and and therefore you know it becomes a bit murkier in in, in that context. The question is, and if I should limit it to the advanced reactors, you know, development, could things not have been easier if all the, you know, the, uh, maybe from the IEA point of view, we now we have over 80 percent, sorry, 80 uh, technologies, over 80 technologies. What if there were common kind of understanding in terms of 
putting investments together to invest and research into few technologies. You take US as an example, uh, so many vendors developing advanced reactors. What about if they had come together, you know, put their resources together, you know, put the knowledge together? Probably we will not be talking about first of a kind now, probably we will have some advanced reactors already uh, in the market. So, um, how to deselect, as I said, all these players, vendors, technology holders, regulatory bodies, governments will have to come into the picture and um, make, like, like we say, walk the talk. Get us to that end goal of realizing this, you know, tripling of the nuclear uh, uh, renaissance. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to move to three more or less rapid questions as we're coming toward the end of the panel. Uh, and the first one, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask this, given that one of our uh, partners is the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And if you recall in Ross's presentation, uh, dimension or uh, four or theme four had to do with non-proliferation. So how do you think about non-proliferation design as a selection criteria for new reactor technologies. How should we think about that? Because my understanding is that, at least with the new vendors that are out there, it may not be top of mind as they're thinking about uh, the designs and, and rollout of their, of their solutions. And Henri, I'm gonna pass this over to you. What, any, any thoughts or any uh, initial reactions to that question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll answer your question, or I'll try to answer your question, but I, I just want to uh, add an element to the yeah. previous please uh, do. Please uh, do. Uh, discussion on uh, you know, building that order book. I, I think we haven't mentioned it before. Yes, there are, there are lots of designs of small modular reactors. There are, there are quite a, a lot of designs of large uh, reactors as well. Um, uh, Stephen mentioned the uh, aeronautics industry where there are two big giants, but you know, that came from a, a down select and... Uh, uh, a, a competition uh, aspect. Competition, it will be very good uh, because in the end we need very good products. Uh, but of course, there are also additional uh, considerations like a, 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 a national preference, uh, uh, governments uh, la launching their own order books, uh, uh, all these con considerations. But the, the point I wanted to, to, to add is we need to do more work, the industry needs to do more work on standardization. Um, in terms of uh, small modular reactors, the, the IAEA launched uh, uh, two years ago an initiative called uh, a Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative. But just to focus on the standardization, and I, I remember a conversation with a, a person from Westinghouse a couple of years ago. It wasn't about uh, uh, small modular reactors, it was about large reactors. Uh, and she was saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if a steam generator for a Westinghouse reactor could also fit a Fhamatom or a Korean reactor? that would build an order book for, for, for components that, that make uh, uh, nuclear reactors. So we, I think we need to, to also think about supply chain, uh, standardization of components uh, as a way of uh, building demand uh, uh, for maybe, different, in the end, different kinds of, uh, of, of designs. So we have that in the aeronautics industry. Uh, uh, Airbus and Boeing uh, share some of the same suppliers. We don't see that much uh, uh, in, in the nuclear industry. So in terms of uh, uh, safeguards by design, I was involved a, a couple of years ago in, uh, uh, in the Generation 4 International Forum, and uh, uh, that was part of the you know, criteria, designs of, uh, of uh, advanced reactors, safeguards by design, but there's also safety, security by design. So I, I, think, there is, uh, I think the designers are, are aware of uh, of the need to, to take into account uh, 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 non-proliferation. You know, early on, uh, uh, from the point of view of the design of the reactor and the fuel, uh, the fuel cycle. Um, so I don't know that all the designers uh, do that and do that well, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, it should be done, you know, at necessary at the, at, at the design stage. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Huff, I understand that you need, there are other obligations on your time. So thank you for joining us, and we're going to give you a hand as you leave. 
Thank you. Um, and I'm going to hand it actually, Michelle. How do you how do you think about non-proliferation? Um, I can say a couple of things about non-proliferation. Uh, one is that um, unlike the IAEA, uh, uh, NEA's mandate doesn't cover non-proliferation. So uh, I am not an expert matter on non-proliferation, but uh, but uh, when we've uh, looked at uh, you know conditions for success, uh, enabling conditions uh, for SMO deployment, in particular uh, in the NEA SMO dashboard uh, that we've published earlier this year, you know we did acknowledge that uh, critical paths for a number of SMO would be hard to approach uh, non-proliferation. Non uh, and, uh, and, and, and probably making sure that we find the right balance between, uh, you know, on the, on the one hand, the, 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 the attributes uh, and the attractiveness of, of uh, safety, uh, proliferation re resistant by design, uh, and also making sure that these approaches uh, remain risk informed. Uh, and so I think uh, clearly uh, it, you know, alongside the other points uh, around harmonization, sonization, and the likes that has, have been previously highlighted, uh, this is clearly an area where uh, there needs to be some sales conversations uh, and that where policymakers and industry need to come together uh, in, and you know, relevant bodies uh, in the year to come uh, so that we can address that up front uh, because it is going to be a critical path uh, to scale up a deployment of a number of SMR designs. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yumo, do you have a, a quick thought on that before we move on to a different subject? Um, well, I don't think I have any uh, answer to the question except to say that um, international organizations and also commitment of vendors, technology developers has to be, you know, focused on ensuring the, you know, uh, issue of uh, non-proliferation is addressed. Um, because nuclear, you know, the goal, the expectation of nuclear can be achieved, sustained, and continuously improved if all of us commit to ensure that the technology is, is free from you know, um, you know, non-civil applications. And so there is a call on everybody involved to ensure the issues of non-proliferation is well addressed in the design and also in the operation of such facilities. Thank you. Um, moving on to uh, thinking about the future, and Anna, I'm going to uh, ask you about this. And we've now entered the era of implementation uh, or deployment, you know, kicked off by the pledges that have been um, promulgated here. So imagine, if you will, uh, a year from now, and you're happy. Your heart is singing because good things have happened. What has happened? What could the industry have done? What would have occurred that leaves you quite pleased with the progress that's been made in only 12 months? Well, firstly, will make us happy, not just me, to continue to see uh, the nuclear uh, staying at uh, the stage where it belongs not to be anymore the bow bow in the room, that to be in a corner that nobody wanted to talk to or to touch to. And that's been gained in the last year. And I think for the years to come, I think we have a great momentum. And through your efforts, again, you, you know, maybe sometimes um, we, you need um, to promote more. We need to promote more your work because you are doing an amazing work of showing the benefits from the nuclear, not just in terms of energy. So it will make me happier, not just to continue to secure the financing, because that's a huge challenge again. And maybe we all, if you agree, we will continue those efforts to shift the narrative from the spending to the investment. Um, then to have the deployment, uh, a, a fast deployment of the SMRs, but complementary to the large traditional builds as well, to secure that uh, uh, supply chain, to secure the workforce, to continue to have that maybe uh, more efforts and more progress on the standard uh, design, because that will help exactly what you are saying, uh, full deployment. But what will make me particularly happy is that if the people 
the communities will embrace the nuclear as being part of the of of their uh, livelihood and you know or part of the community and that means showing the benefits from the nuclear not just in terms of the energy but on the health uh, on the water on the agriculture i was uh, i was uh, last week in vienna um, and um, uh, at the IEA um, headquarters. And you know, I was incredibly surprised by uh, a study that was shown that actually the nuclear is helping to really see the age of a water, and that will really help to not just to preserve the water, but actually really help several countries that the, they might face some challenges when it comes to the water or on the food, where you actually practically uh, build resilience mm -hmm. to, to the food. So uh, I think all those benefits will really, really be very happy. And what will make me particularly happy to end will be to uh, learn and to, uh, from us to we are willing to share our experience how are we managing it i have here with me ludmila she's uh, instrumental in keeping the public support uh, the awareness but the embracement of the public support in romania we have more than 80 percent acceptance and actually we move from our experience from Cerna Voda plant where we have the units uh, one and two now to the Deutsches plant for the SMR and actually we have now the second generation of the workforce coming from uh, from uh, from Cernavoda uh, to to Deutsches but the community in Deutsches embraced and accepted the, the nuclear because they see it part of their community. But you know what? It's not just about the money we invested and we, uh, because we didn't spend it. We invested in, in the community, in the schools and the hospitals. Mm -hmm. But it's actually um, being part of that community and being embraced. And this is uh, uh, um, an example of success that Nuclear Electrica is doing, and we are very happy to share it. So if we will promote that more, where the communities are embracing the, the mm -hmm. nuclear as part of their community with all the benefits, not just in terms of the energy, that will be an, an amazing achievement uh, for next year's COP. And I will be very happy to be again present here and continue the good work that you guys are doing. That's great, that's, that's ambitious. Um, <laughs> Actually, the, in the last two minutes, I'm going to pivot once again. And if each of you, if you had a call to action to NGOs and think tanks like us, what, what role do we play? What would you want to see from us over, say, the next year or two years to support the deployment of new nuclear for, for climate? Um, probably 30 seconds each, and then we're done. Michel, let's start with you. Um, well, I have a long list, so I need to boil it down to one. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, my pick of the moment is uh, going back to uh, the ministerial, uh, well, leaders level uh, declaration on tripping. Uh, um, I think it was last week. I lost track of the days. Uh, but one thing on which President Macron called on specifically was on the World Bank mm -hmm. to revert its current position on nuclear energy, uh, which currently prohibits the bank at different levels to finance or fund. Uh, nuclear projects, uh, including capacity development, uh, and you know, of course, this this has this is very essential for emerging economies, uh, but this has cas cascading, rippling effect mm -hmm. across nuclear financing more broadly because uh, um, World Bank is a bit of a standard setting, uh, and so has an impact on on private financing as well, uh, and so I think you know, based on this leaders level uh, commitment statement, uh, this is something on which uh, we all gonna have to do our homework, uh, and I think. Uh, organization uh, such as Clean Task Force and others will clearly uh, have to play a role uh, in, uh, in taking this agenda forward over the next uh, 12 months. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mio, uh, Yamoe, you have the last word, right. given the Thank time. Uh, so um, I, I would say, I mean, beyond the pledges, the, how much steps, commitments are we putting? You know, earlier on, Dr. Hoff was talking about, we are not going to wait for 2047, 2050. So the future begins now. So what practical steps have we taken in order to realize that future? That is how I will measure uh, success in terms of the nuclear agenda. Thank you. Thank you. So the future begins now. Um, 
and uh, it's been kicked off with this wonderful panel and this presentation. So thank you very much for your insights. Very much appreciated. Let's give everyone a hand.